Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention to my weekly email newsletter, Friday Focus. Each Friday, I focus on one topic with one action arising. The link to sign up is in the show notes or head over to amyrolinson.com and sign up right now. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by Sue Richardson. Sue, a very warm welcome. Thank you so much, Amy. It's lovely to be here. Well, it's been a long time in the making. We we wanted to do this a long time ago, and there's been various things like COVID has got in the way and all sorts of things. So we're finally here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let's start with what is it you're doing at the moment? Well, uh, I run a company called The Right Book Company. Um, I am a publisher. Um, I publish books uh, for businesses and for people who have great stories to tell. Uh, It's my absolute honour and delight to be able to do that. And I am based in in Bristol, uh, which I love. I live in, in this beautiful city of Bristol. And um, and life is good. That's what I'm doing at the moment. I love that. And tell me, great stories to tell. Mm. Let's hear yours. Oh, okay. <laughs> where shall I start, Amy? <laughs> at the beginning of your story, Sue. Well, where does the story start? Wow. Well, the story starts, I suppose, back as a tiny wee one when I insisted that I grabbed the book out of my mother's hands at the age of three and and started to read. That magic, magic moment. You know how with children, stories light up their lives. Stories, you know, I can have a picture of myself and many other children that I've read to over the years with the the magic of a story and and the world that it takes a child into. And I was captivated from the start, as many, many, many children are. But I wanted to be in control of that story myself. I wanted to read that story myself. My mum, I always used to say, my mum taught me how to read when I was three. And she said, no, I didn't. You taught yourself. You just just needed to do it. Um, And so... Oh, my, my my story with books began right back then. And um, and I, I grew up absolutely as a complete bookworm. And uh, I remember my my mum always used to take me to the library um, once a week to pick up my allocated amount of books. And the librarian there was very kind and gave me a double allocation because I never you know I never had enough books to last me for the week so um it was it was a very special relationship right from the start and um uh, however I kind of went on and didn't go immediately into the world of publishing from school I was I was determined I was going to be um in the theatre that was my first love I suppose in a way if I think back that was all about storytelling. You know, the whole thing in a way has been always about storytelling. It's funny how you see these threads, isn't it, through through life when you look back. But I didn't really get on with the theatre. It was a really tough, very stressful world. And I was not a very confident sort of person in my early 20s. And I didn't have what it took. I I loved the creative part. I loved the rehearsals and I loved the pushing things together. Um, and the whole kind of teamwork of theatre was wonderful. But when it actually came to performing on stage, I was so, so nervous and full of stage fright and hated every minute of it. And I thought, you know what, apart from the fact that I also had to learn how to do all sorts of other things in order to feed myself and pay the rent, 
um, you know, like I learned how to be a cook and I learned how to do all sorts of jobs, office jobs to just to earn money because there was no money in theatre. But in the end, I thought, no, it's not for me. And I moved. I started to run courses at a, a drama school. Which was which was great fun, but that kind of led me on into higher education and I, I became um, a lecturer for a while um, in higher education. Came out of that and decided that actually none of that had suited me at all. And the thing that I returned to my first love and thought, you know, I missed a trick here because what I really should have always been doing was publishing. So I came to it a little bit late, really. I was in my early 30s by the time I started really training as an editor. I started as a proofreader and then I became a copy editor and then I started doing project management. And it was the kind of late 90s, early noughties that I thought I would step into the world of actually publishing for myself. So I worked for 10 years for other publishers before doing my own thing. So that's kind of where it all began and where it sort of, where I, I ended up really mm, creating my company based almost like on, it wasn't exactly trial and error, but it was certainly, I hadn't ever intended to start a publishing company, let me put it that way. And can you remember, Sue, that first book that you actually grabbed from your mother's hands? That's a very good question. I don't know if I can remember that book because I was so little, but I do remember being absolutely captivated by Dr. Zeus. You know, the um, green eggs and ham. Um, and I remember when I was a little bit older, the Arthur Ransom books, yes, Swallows, Swallows and Amazons. Amazons. We didn't mean to go to sea. My dad used to read those to, to us as children, and uh, they took me into a world. Oh, and of course, C.S. Lewis, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. You know, the magical worlds where extraordinary creatures lived and amazing things happened and sometimes a bit scary, but you know, always ending up okay. And yeah, just books were an absolute escape, I suppose, in a way. So with that, are you still in, in fiction? No, not at all. Um, funnily enough, I've just come back from a holiday in Cyprus and I spent 10 days sitting in the sun reading novels. <laughs> it's absolutely my idea of heaven. Um, I did an English literature degree and spent three years reading books, reading fiction, poetry, um, plays, you know. So that whole world is massive for me, but I've never worked in it, ever. I'd, it, I don't know why. I don't know what happened. I, I suppose in a way my reason for getting into publishing was not to do in some ways with my love of of fiction or poetry or theatre it was more to do with um seeing that the kind of amazing things that books could teach I think I I kind of stepped into the I guess it was partly because I was in the education space myself for a while and so you know, where the kind of the storytelling combines with education is really magical and, and very much where I sit now. But I've never learned how to be a fiction editor or you know, I wouldn't know where to begin, quite honestly. I think it's so subjective, you know, um, so it's a very different, different thing. So whatever you're doing, you're surrounded by books, whether that be in your resting, in your in your workplace, it's either fiction or nonfiction. So it was always going to be the case, clearly, because of, of that magical moment that you described yourself where you taught yourself to read and you had all this captivation from the wonderful different worlds. What's Sue's world now? 
So I guess my world is um, is is a world that I would like to say enables a lot of other people's worlds to expand. And I think maybe that's the key, that's the core thing about books, isn't it? It's that expansion of one's world, either by the reading or by the creating of a book. And in my world, I, I hold a lot of people's ability to expand their own world and others. I, I'm blessed to run a company, that, a publishing company, and to publish books that have no boundaries. They are, they are not um, restricted by the requirements of a traditional publisher. We don't, we don't have to be concerned about whether we're going to sell 10,000 copies of a particular book. It gives us this freedom to be able to work with an author to create a fantastic book that serves them, serves their business, and serves their audience, whatever that might be. That might not even have massive commercial value in the, in the sort of traditional sense of as I say, selling 10,000 books or whatever it is. Of course, it's nice if they do, but it's not about that. So my world is full of these possibilities of people being able to step into that and, and tell their stories and expand their worlds and expand other people's worlds as a result. I love that. It's so, it's so great to hear. Tell me more about the freedom and the opportunities. Are they values that you hold or are they sort of visions that you have or both? Or neither? I, I would say that they are, they are both. Absolutely. And of course, the lovely thing about the word vision is that, you know, it goes on and on, doesn't it? You know, the horizon is never really fixed. You know, we, we go on we go on seeing new possibilities and new horizons and, and new opportunities. But if we can do that, and I believe that, I believe it, it's not an easy thing to do to really, really sit comfortably in, in your own values. But I, I am, I'm striving to, to always work to a place where uh, that that freedom, that possibility for my authors comes first, and it it's it isn't it. We do get drawn into these. We get, we get drawn into these pressures. I might say, um, which you know, the pressure of well, you know, this is the right way to do something. This is you know, we we need to um, to have. Uh, a a particular picture of the way that we do things, particularly when it comes to publishing books. And for me, as far as I'm concerned, the what's important is that we create the best possible product, but that actually the experience for the author is as important as it is for the reader. So it, by uh, what I mean by that in a way is that, you know, we are, we are creating products, we are creating books that we sell, that we, that we then hope lots and lots of readers will, their worlds will be expanded and, and they will learn stuff and, and all sorts of good things will happen because they read our author's books. Of course, that's all really important. But actually, it's the expansion of the author's world that we sometimes forget. And that freedom to be able to spend the time thinking about who we really are, what we really have to offer, what our purpose is in life. Is, is it, it's a gift that a book gives an author. So it's a brave thing to do. It's a courageous thing to do. It takes time. It's it's hard work. It's you know it takes a lot of energy. It's um, it, 
it's not an easy thing to do, but boy, does it have its rewards. And what I love about where I sit is that I have the opportunity to support people in that process. So it's not just about that product at the end of the day. It's about where this whole journey of writing and thinking and writing about your book is going to take you, how it's going to make you grow, how it's going to make you blossom, how it's going to help you build your business, your brand, connect you with other people, tell your story, all of those magical things that happen because you've been able to go on that journey. And you briefly touched there on purpose. You talked about finding out who we are and what we have to offer and the purpose. Mm -hmm. Tell me, how does focus on why fit into the right book company? And and what what about your purpose, Sue? Yeah, it's it's a great question, Amy. I mean, it's funny. I mean, you know, I, I know that you and I have spent, you know, some great time together and had some great conversations. And I, I know that, you know, one of the things that you'll be aware of about me is that I always start with why. I mean, I, you know, the, if we don't start with our why on. So if we imagine for a moment that, you know, we in our world, we have something really fabulous to offer um, and and. And many people do this. You know, there may be many people who step out onto a stage, for example, or who go to a networking event and talk about what it is that they do. And they may get really good at that. They may get really good at talking about how they help their customers or, you know, or what they can what they can do that makes a difference in the world. All sorts, you know, from big to small, from, you know, it doesn't matter that there are lots of ways that we can tell our stories. We can blog, we can do all sorts of things. But quite often, I think we get a bit lost in the kind of the the nuts and the bolts and the, you know, the doings of our business. We get a bit lost in the client's needs or we get a bit lost in, you know, the kind of the intricate bits of running a business. And what I really seriously believe is that if if we give ourselves, if we're going to do something, we're going to say, okay, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to put all this down. I'm going to kind of collect my knowledge, my expertise, and, and extend it to a wider world, to a wider audience. And many people will come to that simply because they have that knowledge and that expertise. It's just there in their heads. You know, they've, They've built up all this stuff and they just want to put it out there. But many, many times what can happen is that that comes out the other end and it, it's a little mundane it, or maybe it's a little bit the same as somebody else has done. And it's partly, I think, because they haven't focused on their why. They haven't sat down and really thought carefully about what it is that they, that they are doing this for. And the, and the why obviously connects with the who, so who it is that they're doing it for, but the why comes first. Because if you don't really know what it is you want to achieve in the world, if you don't really have a clear picture of your purpose, it's really hard, no matter how much knowledge and expertise you've got, to actually make that work for other people. And so for me, the connection with Focus on Why is that a purposeless book is a book that it may have a few technical, interesting bits of information for some people, but it has no heart. You know, it has no, it has no reach. It has no uh, possibility to really engage. You know, we need to be truly authentic in our books in the same way that we need to be truly authentic on a, on a stage or in anything that we do. We, we need to find our voice. And actually just the process of putting yourself through writing the book teaches you so much. You may come to it without really understanding what your purpose is, but you, if you can discover it in the process of giving yourself that space to write and to explore and to be with yourself, actually. One of the things I love about writing in, in itself is it, it, it's, it's, I think I've often said, I think it's the best, personal development exercise that any of us can ever do it's we have 
easy access to it. You know, it's a pen and paper or a, a laptop. It's, you know, a daily writing exercise of some kind can lead us to so much self-awareness and discovery. And I think that's really powerful. But when you come to go, okay, deep, deep content here, I'm going to write a book, you are beginning a, I, I've seen people literally transform in that process. And does it happen in the same way that it can happen with people who are writing fiction that you can get artist block, writer's block rather, in writing with a non-fiction book? Is it the same process? I think it's exactly the same, although I have to add that I don't really believe in writer's block. Um, I mean, if I don't want to deny anyone the experience. You know, I get that there is an experience that people will sometimes express as writer's block, but that almost assumes there's just one thing. <laughs> and actually, there's all sorts of reasons why people don't write for a period of time. You may be, it may be quite often, and, and I think the whole idea of writer's block can really cause a problem because we can get stuck in this place of, oh, my God, I've got writer's block. How do you get out of that? You know, it's you're giving yourself a label that may not be terribly helpful. If there's a reason why your writing has paused, then that's more interesting to explore. So just, you know, the working with somebody. Another thing that happens, you know, Amy, is that people think that writing has to be done alone. And it is so not true. I believe that the best books that get written are those that have been written with whatever support that writer needed. Now, whether that's a full-blown book coach or, a, you know, we, we have our book buddies groups where, you know, people get together and they, they just support each other through the process, but you don't have to be alone. And, and, and if you have people to talk to about the moments when something isn't quite working, you believe maybe you have writer's block then you have the chance to explore what's actually really going on. It might be that you need a break. You need time to think away from the writing itself, you know, going for long walks, having long conversations with trusted friends and colleagues, um, maybe going away and reading something about your, you know, there are all sorts of reasons why you might stop and pause in the writing. And I've, I've recently read, well, actually it was, it was a couple of years ago now, so not that recent, but <laughs> it, time just kick, flies by. A couple of books, one was on writing, The Memoir of the Craft by Stephen King. Oh, yes. And The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. Mm. And both these books have come to mind for different reasons from what you just shared. One, I'll start with, with Stephen King on the writing, a beautiful way of showing how you can combine fiction and non-fiction into one piece and just story tell your life and it's, it's fantastic book I really recommend it to anybody who's thinking of writing a book and the artist way in terms of being creative and you were talking earlier about how you can find your voice and discover it and the the beauty of journaling which is what Julia Cameron's advocating here and, and that sort of streamless writing of where you just write away your thoughts at it's just so powerful what's been sort of critical for you in terms of your inspirations well first of all I have to say that Julia Cameron is a massive and always has been a massive influence so you, you've kind of stolen that one from me already you can uh, have her too doesn't fair it? Enough. I mean, we can share we can yeah. share um, I've done morning pages for huge chunks of my life and uh, and most recently throughout COVID um, found it massively helpful. Um, and, you know, for, for those of your listeners who don't, I think a lot of people have discovered morning pages during, during COVID, um, but that whole three pages of longhand, absolute, you know, stream of consciousness, not never read it again, you know, if you want, tear it up and throw it straight away. It has taught me so much about um, the way that we stop ourselves, you know, and the way actually that, you know, we can train ourselves to just allow our creativity to flow and to accept it, you know, for whatever comes out. 
It doesn't always have to look pretty or perfect at all. It just is. And, and we kind of can really unblock ourselves that way to go back to your previous question. Influences, oh goodness. I mean, so many, but I, I suppose in a way, some of the greatest storytellers are probably my greatest influences. I mean, it's going to sound mad, but I'm an absolute, I love Shakespeare. I mean, I do, I go back to the theatre then and I think of how stories are brought to life on stages. But, you know, Shakespeare was a master storyteller, but underneath those stories with these shared human experiences, these, this ability to kind of, the way he draws us in and makes us feel it's all about us. Even if it's you know, kings and queens and, you know, it, 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 people who are completely outside of, of our own experience, we're in there with their, with their humanity. And, and that's those great, great storytellers for me, whether they're, and you're right. I mean, Stephen King, of course, is the absolute master of the storyteller and, and that book is, is superb. But I, I come back to the most of the books that we publish, I suppose you could put in the kind of business book category and the best ones are the ones that have found a way to connect with their readers by telling great stories. And so, it, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it comes back to story all the time. Isn't that interesting? I love it. And and <laughs> having grown up in Stratford Avon, I'm with you on Shakespeare. So I, I, in fact, we've spoken at an event and we both we were quoting from Shakespeare. And I think that as I went up first, you were like, darn it, Amy's got pit me to it. It's gonna <laughs> and I remember it was it was lovely to have the diff, the both of these influences echoed in our work. And I'm as a podcaster using influence from 400 plus years ago now and and likewise for you and your inspiration and the way that you're working because it is I mean he he focused on humanity and those moments those pulls that we have in our life and that those experiences that we have haven't changed yes society and the way that we operate and we've got more gadgets than he had but otherwise human emotions are still there yeah absolutely absolutely so tell me, you're talking about expanding other people's worlds and, and helping people to, to have that ability to expand and not be restricted by the boundaries and requirements. And it was interesting because you, you called it your book, your book business, your publishing business is called The Right Book Company. And you were talking about the pressures that people have about the right way to do something. Now, I know you've got a play on words with the right, right, but talk to me, there, is there a right way? Um, the only right way is, is, is the way that will serve you, your audience, and, and honour your own purpose. That, I would say, is absolutely fundamental. There are so many wrong ways to do it which it because and and I see it all the time and and I don't want to bang on about the negative at all sadly you know there there are a number of a number of kind of ways that publishing books is presented that it's it it's almost a kind of transactional thing you know you just you just as I said earlier you just have this knowledge this expertise and you just bang it out there and that's all that matters I've, I, it, it falls over if it doesn't if if it doesn't honor you, your authentic self, your purpose, your what you're really all about at a slightly deeper level. I believe, and not saying that every book has to be terribly deep and meaningful. That's not really what I mean, but it has to serve your purpose, and and often it doesn't, and so. It, it, it seems like an obvious thing, but it's just, it, you know, one can get quite sort of prosaic about this and say, well, actually, it's about building a business case for a book. It's about making sure that 
there's a good reason for the existence of that book in the world and and that it will do a job you know it, it's got a job to do and and that you enable it to do to do that job to the best of your ability and as a publisher for me that's that's really all it's about it of course there are all sorts of ways and there are kind of lots of nuanced ways I guess of uh, making sure that a book is is right but fundamentally it's about making sure that the book is 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 serving that author's purpose and if you had to say in a sentence Sue what your purpose is what would it be I think my purpose is to enable and empower people to tell their stories in such a way that they transform their own world and that of others. And do you think you knew that at age three? <laughs> what a lovely question. I wonder. <laughs> I can only wonder about that, Amy. I don't know. Perhaps I did. Because there seemed to be that magnetic gravitation that you just knew. And your mom's saying that you taught yourself. I'm just going back to that moment where you insisted on grabbing that book from her hands, that you knew that it contained that magic. And that ever since then, that magic has been with you. Because every time you talk about the writing, you know, you light up. It's fascinating, isn't it? It's, uh, it's you know, I said earlier, it's like, you know, when you look back and you see the threads through, but I never, going all the way back to three, yeah, maybe it was always there. I'd certainly remember the magic of being in those other worlds from a very, very early age. And, and here I am, hopefully helping people to create those worlds for themselves and for others. Well, I'm certainly hoping that you're going to help me create my world and, and my and my book, because Great. for me, I, I honestly, I was that little girl like you that created my own library, I even stamped my own books and, you know, check them in and out. You know, you play those <laughs> games. And ironically, I've spoken about this before in some of my reflections episodes, but I was destined to be a librarian when I got my 16 year old test back that you fill in and you have to say all these things and they give you your career prospects and that was what my career prospect was and and I poo-pooed it I was like well I can't be a librarian I need to be something much more important than that you know but now hey I'm a modern day librarian curating all these fantastic stories on my podcast I'm happy more than happy for that to be the case but I'm definitely going to be someone who also adds a book to that library Fantastic. I'm very, very glad to hear that, Amy. Wonderful. I'm still not sure which camp it will be in, though, whether it will be in the fiction, non-fiction or a blend of the both. And I think that, you know, you, there can be, you know, you can whatever it is, your authentic self. And I do bridge both those worlds. Definitely. I mean, I, I absolutely have no issues with that. There are so many fantastic books that are educational and informative and helpful and useful in the business world in in all sorts of worlds but particularly in the business world that are actually fictional they are they're created around a story I think about books like fish you know I think about well even um you know the, the very wonderful e-myth is a story that, that lots and lots of great great who moved my cheese you know there's dozens of fabulous fables stories fictional yeah they're, they're just great stories and and if you can do that I've got one author actually at the moment Paul Harris who's who's working on his own business book which is completely a novel so it's very doable and very exciting when it, it but it's particularly it not it's not easy to do but that doesn't that's not a reason not to do it um no, I think I'm it's a fantastic you. way yeah. I think one of my favorite ones is The Alchemist in that oh, essence. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, honestly, I could talk books forever and, <laughs> yes. and and I'm sure we will, but for the sake of our listeners, we'll start to wrap up. Yeah. How could people get in contact with you, Sue? What's the best way for them to reach out? Well, the easiest thing to do is um, to, if they want to find out a bit more about the right book company, is it's the right book company.com. Nice and easy. Um, head there. And actually on that website, if you wanted to have a chat with me, you can, because you can click a link and fill in a very, very simple form. And don't be intimidated by it. You don't have to kind of write a treatise or anything or do any kind of pitch. You just need to just tell us a little bit about yourself and you can book a call with me. Equally, love to hear from you if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm just Sue Richardson. That may not be all that easy to find, but... Um, you know, LinkedIn, uh, one way or the other, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can certainly find the right book company on LinkedIn as well. And you can find me through that. So probably the easiest way. Perfect. Well, I'll put the direct link into the show notes so that you can find exactly how to get hold of Sue via LinkedIn. So perfect. Thank you, That's Thank you Sue. Thank you. And I highly recommend people having a chat with you about whatever their idea is for their book, because you will set them on the straight and narrow and focus on their why with them for sure. <laughs> Have you got some final words to round up this wonderful conversation, please, Sue? Ah, oh, well, um, yes, I, I would love to say, if you've got a little tiny, tiny voice in your head that says, I could write a book, and you've been telling it to go away <laughs> for a long time, or you've been saying things like, or somebody in your head's been saying things like, you can't do that. <laughs> you haven't got enough information. You don't know enough. You, you haven't got the time. All of the other little voices that creep in and say that you can't or shouldn't or whatever. Please <laughs> listen to the voice that says, I've got a book because I really, really do believe that we all have a book inside us. And if we can really just remember that we don't have to be alone, that we can go out and get support to get that book out and that we can follow our purpose, that it will be a life transforming thing to do. So go for it. How has this conversation had an impact on you? What value have you received from tuning in? What are your reflections with actions? Please take a moment to leave me an Apple podcast or Spotify review sharing how Focus on Why has made a difference to you today. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, simply connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.